Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the upcoming 12th core entry in Ubisoft's historical murder series, is set to be a very different experience than the first game was in 2007. What was once a regimented stealth adventure set in the key cities of the Third Crusade is now a vast, country-spanning action RPG with Vikings, character abilities, settlement management and siege warfare. Assassin's Creed has evolved, but Valhalla is just the latest in a long bloodline of ancestors that have constantly brought change over the series' lifetime. This is why Assassin's Creed is so beautiful. It's a brand, it's a universe that can morph. Assassins never were the exact same through the time periods. And so we have ways to keep the creed, for example, to keep the values, to keep the more important iconic elements, while actually assessing and accepting and embracing the specificities of each time period. There are a few things more endemic to Assassin's Creed than parkour. Building on what Ubisoft Montreal had learned while developing fluid navigation for Prince of Persia Sands of Time, the team working on the original game made the cities of Damascus, Akko and Jerusalem like pedestrianised Grand Theft Auto maps, featuring then unprecedented vertical scale. But while protagonist Altair's adventures had allowed him to climb and sprint across the towering walls of the Holy Land, an internal post-mortem after release concluded that parkour was ultimately underutilised. A lot of the actual missions we were asking the players to do were not relying on the strength of the game. And so this is why in AC2 we said, okay, we need to use that as a gameplay block during missions. To better integrate parkour into Assassin's Creed 2, which shifted the world forward almost 300 years and relocated the action to Renaissance-era Italy, the team created what they call Free Run Highways. It was literally a highway for parkouring where at any given time the player is able to identify uh, a ramp that would lead up to the rooftops and it became more important to do so because we added the ability to do air assassinations so we wanted to bring the player up to the higher levels of the city so that you have more opportunities to actually kill people down below. Assassin's Creed 2 featured a variety of new elements in its level design to ensure players would make use of the entire city, rather than limiting activities to individual landmarks. Markers in the world, such as a white sheet, indicated routes that could be easily climbed up to the rooftops, and strong enemies on the ground would actively chase you to encourage seeking higher elevation. And when high above the streets, guards and snipers ensured that rooftops were not safe sanctuaries away from challenge as they had been in the original game. Combined, these elements made parkour deeply integral to experiencing Assassin's Creed 2's world. Old. Alongside parkour, Ubisoft Montreal knew it had to make improvements to Assassin's Creed's social stealth systems, an idea inspired by the crowds used in IO Interactive's Hitman games. They had a carnival map, and there was a massive crowd of people um, that you could walk through. I think their NPCs were very low res, so there wasn't that much behavior in them, but we still wanted to achieve that dream. Well, it was, you know, to nail completely this fantasy of being an assassin, you know. So it's either you dominate the situation from above, so using the climbing, the parkour, etc., or you're at the ground level but just disguised in the middle of everybody and nobody knowing that you're there. While the first Assassin's Creed featured groups of monks that you could blend in with, the sequel offered a more challenging take on hiding in plain sight, the courtesans. What would happen is as you walk around with the courtesans, um, they would peel off one after the other as soon as you met guards. So it was like having shield or life in a shooter game where every time you encounter an obstacle, so a guard, a courtesan would peel off. Alongside the courtesans, protagonist Ezio could also employ the assistance of local thieves, who would assist him while running across the city, and mercenaries who could help in battle. The three groups bolstered Assassin's Creed's three main design pillars of social stealth, parkour and fighting, which ensured the sequel both played better and was more varied than its predecessor. But all of these elements are overshadowed by Assassin's Creed 2's biggest change, a full overhaul of the game's structure. I see one, you know, structure with the, with the memory blocks, was a bit repetitive and we were also liking variety in terms of actions. So this is why we uh, we massively reworked the, the global structure with, with the sequences and the memories in, inside them and adding a lot of uh, side content, you know, and so other activities, introducing an economic system, having the villa that you could build, you know, and, and upgrade progressively that would give meaning to some other uh, missions and actions. And so all this 
made AC2 a, a much more complete game. Rather than a series of targets you took down in largely similar methods, Assassin's Creed 2 embraced its world and turned Renaissance Italy into a playground filled with collectibles, activities and secrets. It's a design approach that not only revolutionised Assassin's Creed, but established the blueprint for many other open world games Ubisoft would go on to make. The impact of Assassin's Creed 2 can be felt across series like Watch Dogs, Far Cry and Ghost Recon, not to mention plenty of other non-Ubisoft games. It was a defining moment in the company's history and one that would impact the entire gaming community for years to come. Assassin's Creed 2 also added one small element that, at the time, no one on the team could have foresaw what it would evolve into. We were allowed to have water. Altair was afraid of water. He died when he jumped in it. Uh, Ezio was not, so that gave us a, a pretty big dimension. He got us our boats also for the first time. Two games later, the little gondolas coasting along the canals of Venice became colossal warships in Assassin's Creed 3. Fascinatingly, the introduction of the galleons and broadside volleys of naval combat came via something of a Destiny's Crossroad moment, when a new prototype arrived at Ubisoft Montreal. I saw a couple of designers reviewing the naval battle and we knew it, it, it had some potential. The prototype in question had come in from Ubisoft Singapore. The team there had developed a ship-to-ship -ship combat system, albeit without any specific Assassin's Creed project in mind. The team at Ubisoft Montreal quickly realised that naval battles fit perfectly with their new American Revolution setting. Suddenly it made sense that new protagonist Connor wasn't just an assassin, but also a ship captain too. This feeling of, of being on a ship, firing the cannons and everything, was something really powerful that we knew we, we had to explore, so it, it branched off from very quickly from, from a prototype to, okay, let's include it in the game and let's give the, the Singapore team this uh, awesome mandate. <laughs> and the rest is history. Ships were not Ubisoft Montreal's only bold move with Assassin's Creed 3. To shift from Renaissance Italy to the colonial American frontier also meant a radical change in environments. After three games with Ezio as the protagonist, the series had become famed for parkour on tall European buildings, and the likes of 18th century Boston had none of that. Instead, the world design team developed new free-running routes through the natural woodlands of Massachusetts and New York. This new frontier was a breath of fresh air for level designers. The first discussions we had was tree navigation. The added rock climbing, so putting your hands in cracks and stuff. What we lost in altitude, we gain in network. So because you were using vegetation, it was much more permissible to have like wiry branches and um, slightly less predictable paths. So we added trees in there to be able to gap between architecture vegetation, more architecture. Basically, these ingredients sort of helped us create a slightly more organic looking city. And that sort of paved the way for games that came after where, I mean, you look at Origins and Valhalla now, like we're mainly an environment game. We're less about architecture, we were way more about discovering rocks and, and planes and, and forests. Design evolution for both land and sea made Assassin's Creed 3 a bold new chapter in the series' lineage, but it was an awkward step forward. The naval combat was entirely separate from the land-based adventures, effectively making it feel like a separate campaign that had little influence on the main story. For what came next, Ubisoft Montreal knew it had to bring those components together, and so the pirate fantasy of Black Flag was born. I remember one of the first questions the team asked me was, so how do we mix, you know, Assassin's Creed fantasy and pirate fantasy? And to me, the answer was, we need to come up with one game. I didn't want to have an Assassin's Creed game on ground and a pirate game at sea. Black Flag broke Assassin's Creed 3's barrier between land and sea. You could walk from a city to the docks, board your ship, and sail out to sea without a single loading screen. Furthermore, its Caribbean map, a huge archipelago of islands, was a true open world, unlike the large but separate cities of past games. It was the breaking of that technical hurdle that made Black Flag's themes come alive. Boats like that are just freedom. You're the only master <laughs> uh, on board after, after God, it's really you 
in charge. Much of Black Flag felt familiar because it was built atop of Assassin's Creed 3's biggest triumphs. The natural landscapes of the Caribbean islands can trace their origins back to the American frontier, and the new combat options, including a brace full of flintlock pistols, is rooted in the dual wielding birthed in its predecessor. But the glue that bound all this together is Black Flag's true secret weapon. Not a cannon or a cutlass, but a man called Edward Kenway. It was important for us to show that the world of Assassin's Creed is bigger than just always being an assassin. I think it would be akin to if you were making a, um, a Star Wars game or Star Wars films and you always had to be a Jedi. I don't think the universe would work as well. Han Solo analogies aside, Kenway's privateer turned pirate background brought a fresh perspective to the overarching narrative of the series. Rather than being a stoic member of the Assassin's Brotherhood, he was a chancer looking for profit. We thought that if this Assassin's Creed universe has any legs, it should be able to depict the entire world under the influence of these two groups, not just are you an assassin killing Templars? So it was the first time that we said, let's let's show this conflict from the outside looking in. And so at the very beginning of AC4, Edward Kenway steals some assassin robes. He doesn't know who this person is, but he, he knows that there's going to be money at the end of it. Stealing those robes sparks Edward's growth from rebel to honorable captain. Still an outlaw, but one who can live up to the promises he's made to his family back in England. And by focusing on Edward's journey, Black Flag manages to avoid the pitfalls of over-reliance on MacGuffins like the Apple of Eden, a sci-fi device that the series has frequently fallen back on. It's a story about a man finding himself more than it is about a man finding an artifact or treasure. The seafaring adventures of Captain Kenway came together fluidly. But Assassin's Creed isn't just about the past. The present-day narrative is the thread that links the entire series together, and one that had frequently frustrated players. In Assassin's Creed 3, the story of modern protagonist Desmond Miles had concluded in what many fans saw as disappointing fashion, and so Black Flag had the opportunity to reinvent what the present-day framing story could be. At the time, the writing team was feeling the limitations of always having the same man get in the animus to relive the memories of his ancestors, almost always in pursuit of a historical artifact that was crucial to saving the present day. So we hit on this idea that maybe there was an animus that could um, take uh, anyone's blood and any sort of third party observer could go in and observe anyone else. That third party observer would turn out to be the player themselves, rather than any scripted protagonist. This wasn't a shallow decision either. It tied into a broader narrative ambition called Initiates. The idea was that it would be a persistent present day, and that if you were into the modern day story, you would log on to Initiates and there would be constant content, maybe weekly content. Black Flag's story was fused with Initiates, making players themselves part of the overarching narrative. Narrative. But initiates didn't last long, and the program was completely shut down in 2015. The modern day story in Black Flag, which ran into Unity, wrapped up in Assassin's Creed Syndicate a few months after initiates was retired. With that chapter done, a new approach for the present day fiction needed to be found for the next project in the series, a prequel set in ancient Egypt called Assassin's Creed Origins. And that's where Layla Hassan came in. Layla's modern day sequences in Origins were far less frequent than in previous games, and so felt less intrusive. But they were also significantly deeper than many of Desmond's appearances. Rather than being linear narrative chapters, Layla had a laptop that players could freely browse for more information on the larger Assassin's Creed universe. Each new lore tidbit was meticulously crafted by a small team working purely on these present day chapters. But Origins didn't just reset the series' modern narrative. It overhauled almost every aspect of the game. Combat, equipment, progression, even the series' iconic hidden blade were all broken down and rebuilt. It, it was like a necessary step forward. It's something that we, we were feeling for, for a long time. We had the opportunity to do a full country uh, with, with Egypt, and, and it was about giving a lot of freedom for the player to, to explore, to kind of discover this, this, this beautiful world, and obviously it had to translate into the mechanics. The change in mechanics led to a shift in genre for Assassin's Creed as well. Origins and its successor Odyssey both resemble an RPG far more than the stealth action games the series originated as. The decision to add role-playing elements, where you could invest in skill trees to unlock new abilities, came with the realization that the team was building a game that would demand dozens and dozens of hours from players. Origins had to offer more long-term player satisfaction than previous games in the series. I feel that we were we were focusing a lot on the on the minute to minute where uh, okay i have you know beautiful fluid animations when i you know i plunge my hidden blade in an enemy it's really satisfying but now i feel that origins brought the 
a very satisfying hour-to-hour -hour gameplay. We reward the choices of the player, but from a gameplay perspective, you know, not only from a, from an approach or from a, a tactical point of view, but really in terms of uh, uh, the time investment. You have a long-term plan, you have a long-term strategy for your character uh, based on the gameplay style that you like, and the game kind of rewards you for it. Origins featured three skill trees which allowed players to build protagonist Bayek into the kind of character that suited their playstyle. And while those playstyles were familiar to long-term players, broadly speaking dedicated to action or stealth, in Origins they felt very different. For action, that new feel came thanks to an entirely new take on battle. Replacing the parry to auto kill combo system, Origins introduced a more skill-based approach to combat. Mechanically, this meant that instead of being based strictly on a character's animations, it used hitboxes. Every character and weapon has an invisible box drawn around it, and if those items collide with each other, damage is inflicted. We wanted to have a hitbox system which is a lot more reactive, a lot opening up a lot of, of possibilities. Prior to that, you know, like every single move had to be, you know, handcrafted by an animator or mocap or whatever, and then paired with the NPCs. Now, uh, the system gave us a lot of freedom to kind of to tweak and calibrate and, and balance. Yes, it's still based on animations, but what's driving it is really the, the data itself. So what's the range of your weapon, how much damage is it doing, and so on. For players looking to remain true to the series' stealth roots, some relearning was required. The Hidden Blade had its always instant kill nature removed, to reflect Bayek's inexperience with it. Social stealth was removed entirely. Instead of hiding amongst people, the environment was filled with tall grasses and other natural cover. This demanded entirely different strategies from players. We were really focusing on, on the mechanic itself, you know, with uh, the blend in with the RPG. It felt like really like I'm, I'm infiltrating, I'm hiding, I'm using my bow to kill my targets. I was leveling up as much as I can, my, my hidden blade as well. So for me, that's the, the how the stealth was, was really rewarding in the game. It felt, it felt really tactical. I think that's the take that we had on, on stealth. The decision to eliminate social stealth mechanics was controversial, but was ultimately made to support the narrative. Bayek was a medje, something of an ancient Egyptian police officer, and being a recognisable public figure meant social stealth would be impossible for him. But by making Bayek recognisable, the fiction supported a non-linear quest structure. Numerous NPCs from across the country could approach Bayek and ask for help, something they wouldn't ask of an assassin who purposefully hid in the shadows of society. This approach continued into Ubisoft Quebec's Assassin's Creed Odyssey, where protagonist Cassandra or Alexios is a known mercenary, and so social stealth remained absent for another game, traded for further RPG elements like dialogue trees and romance options. But for the next step in Assassin's Creed's evolution, being a blade in the crowd is coming back. We felt it was a good opportunity to bring back the social stealth because you are a Viking in a hostile territory, and it makes sense that you, can, you cannot on, always only fight your way through. Sometimes you have to blend in, you have to try to hide. Alongside the return of social stealth is the resurrection of another lost Assassin's Creed ingredient, the home base. Not seen since Syndicate's rolling locomotive stronghold, Valhalla's players will be able to build a Viking settlement, which grows and develops over time. It's an advancement of the ideas that began in locations like Ezio's villa and Connor's homestead. Yes, we had the villa, we had the homestead, but now it's it's really reshaping the, the game structure itself because you have a village to care for and it's at the center of your, your decisions. It's not a side thing that is optional, like it's really at the center of, of your decisions and it's also the opportunity to see the consequences of your actions. Alongside new mechanics, the team is trying a different approach with storytelling to help anchor the game in the Viking fantasy. The old Icelandic sagas are very interesting in terms of uh, their structure. They don't tell a story. They're actually kind of closer to um, Don Quixote, right? Like a picaresque, where you you have a character and they go on a series of adventures and the character themselves is kind of ever-changing. But there's not a driving plot like you would expect in um, you know, a, a typical movie like a Lord of the Rings where it's just like, do this and go there. The story itself is actually going to be more kind of like a picaresque. It's going to be more individual stories that all accumulate up into a larger uh, sort of a 
greater than the sum of its parts. With a new approach to mythology in the form of the Norse pantheon, large-scale siege warfare, and the inclusion of both Norway and Anglo-Saxon England as locations, it seems like Valhalla could be another major milestone in the history of Assassin's Creed. But whatever evolutions the team at Ubisoft Montreal make, they won't be the last. There's no formula. Uh, all the teams working on all these games are working hard and always pushing to to make the franchise relevant as a modern piece of entertainment, you know? And so this is why the franchise keeps evolving and, and adapting. And if we maintain, if we keep this honesty, we had at the, at the release of AC1, where we always look at what we've done, what are the good things, the, 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 the less good things, then I, I no worry. I mean, there are so many talented people working on the franchise and loving it and wanting to eat to, to carry on that it, it could last for a very long time. From the Holy Land to Valhalla, Assassin's Creed has come a long way. It's always been recognisable, but it's the differences between each game that really makes the series exciting. The big RPG reinvention for Origins came as Assassin's Creed turned 10 years old. It's fascinating to imagine, then, what entirely different genre traits the series may have by the time of its 20th anniversary. Because for a series that is so rooted in our history, it has a lot more of its own still yet to write.